In the space of a single generation, a golden phase of childhood has all but disappeared. We used to go and we'd come in for dinner and then go right back out again until it was dark. Oh, no, no, no. That doesn't happen anymore. I want to play in the tree, but my mom don't let me. The kids now don't go out to play. They go on a play date. Can you imagine? Wherever you go now, people are afraid. Especially parents are absolutely marinated in panic about their kids if they're out of their sight for a moment. Today's parents don't just drop a kid off at the park. My girls, that's just part of life. They wake up in the morning and grab my tracking device. Fear for the safety of kids is matched only by the fear that they might fall behind. On to the next destination. The hardest part for me would probably be doing the homework in the car, because I do get a little bit nauseous. Unstructured and unsupervised play, for the sake of play, has disappeared. A shorter leash and more structure may spell the end of adventure in childhood, but what does it mean to the kids themselves? If you look around, it's a laundry list of things going wrong. Stress, we all know what stress is. People don't understand the value of play, and that is a very serious problem that will have very serious consequences. Most of us born before the mid-1980s remember a much different childhood than the one being played out today. What I remember about play as a boy was freedom and space and being outdoors. You know, I got kicked out of the house in the morning by my mom, and I was out all morning until lunchtime. She'd call out, and we'd go back for lunch, you'd go out, you'd come back for dinner, and we spent a lot of our time as children just on our own. Streets that once hummed with the sounds of kids playing road hockey or skipping on the sidewalk are now eerily quiet. Over the past 20 years, a wave of anxiety over the safety of kids has moved childhood indoors. You listen to the news, you read the newspaper, there's something that has happened to a child. Either in the playground, in the child's house, around the child's environment, it's like you don't feel safe anywhere. Sometimes you can count on mommy, can I do? I say, no, you hurt yourself. And sometimes I feel guilty inside, but then how can I leave my child to be free and play freely like that? I don't know. All the time, we just have to keep watch. Keep your eyes open, watch out for your kid, make sure they're around where you can see them. Internationally best-selling author Carl Honoré spent two years researching play and the state of modern childhood in Europe, Asia, North and South America. I think a lot of what's driving our anxiety and even paranoia is just fear feeding on itself. Because statistically, the world is a safer place for children now than it's ever been before. The trouble is it doesn't feel that way <laughs> to a parent. To a parent, the outside world looks like one enormous cesspit of pedophiles and drunk drivers and just danger around every turn. In New York City, one of the top American experts on the subject of play and child development is Hera Estroff Moreno. I'm sure from the time of Adam and Eve, anxiety went with parenting. But the difference now is that parents really feel free to expose the children to their own anxieties and to kind of act them out. One way parents act out that anxiety is through the new technologies that let them keep closer tabs than ever on their children's every move. When I grew up as a kid, my location was on the street. You know, and when the street lights came on, I went home. These kids aren't like that. If they do play in the street, Sherry generally wants to stand over top of them and pay safe attention to them. 
and we certainly do have this dramatic feeling that there's predators everywhere we turn. Sandwich your blackberry church? Yeah. We use this to eliminate anxiety. We know what's out there. Okay, make sure that the blackberries turn on and the track comes on, okay, Jordan? And if I can alleviate the fear that, that's being generated from myself, the television, and my wife through a simple little piece of technology, why not do it? My girls, that's just part of life. They wake up in the morning and grab my tracking device. All right, let's go. See ya. Have a good day. We're seeing a breadcrumb trail or a popcorn trail, as it's most commonly referred to. Each one of these blue dots represents a true GPS location. And every two minutes, that location gets updated for me. I have the ability to see where they are now, what speed they're heading now, what direction they're heading now. And I'm able to witness and watch uh, the transgression of the girls uh, and their trip to school this morning. What we have here now is what we call a geofence. It's just an invisible gate or a boundary that we've created. So we have the ability to monitor entries and exits, similar to that of an invisible dog fence type scenario. The device recognizes it's crossed that invisible line. It then does an instantaneous report back to us uh, and will show up uh, as an email or as an SMS message. So we can actually see that they're at that bus stop. The old expression of call me when you get there, we don't need that anymore. We know she's there. What you have is an instrument by which parents maintain total control over their children and their movements. And what I find horrible about this is that there is no way for kids to get off this track that the parents have put them on. It's one thing to be put on a track, but these kids can't even play hooky. Today's parents, myself included, don't just drop a kid off at the park without checking twice, thinking twice, debating whether or not we even want to leave that park because we know too much. We know there are predators in that park. You know, the only thing we can do is try to eliminate the worry and try to make them safe as possible. We know immediately if Jordan's left that park. We know immediately if Samantha has gotten on a different bus than Jordan. I think that this is really dangerous to outsource trust to a device and not let the trust grow between parent and child because that's really the foundation of trust in the entire society. If you can't trust your kids, and if the kids can't trust other people, uh, excuse me, how are they gonna build a society that's based on trust? One of the last sacred places for kids to slip off the parental radar and play freely has long been summer camp. But today, even here, hundreds of miles from home, every move is captured, edited, and transmitted daily for the scrutiny of anxious parents. Sometimes you don't even notice it because you're having so much fun, and she does it when you're not looking at her, so you don't really notice it at all. At camps like this one, it's the photographer's job not just to provide parents a window on the camp experience, but to make sure they like what they see. The camera girl, she's really cool, and she always takes pictures of the good stuff when you're happy and stuff. Don't run over me! <laughs> Every day I take upwards of seven to 800 photographs, and then I put them up on the internet. So at least now, you can see them. They have their morning coffee, and they look at their child's pictures. And they will make their assessment on whether their child is having a good time at camp. And if there's a few pictures that they look, you know, the camper looks distressed or just out of the group, they will give us a call. It would be probably three hours a day that we're involved with um, parent issues. They do get anxious if they see their child not smiling. They do get anxious if they don't see their child for a few days, especially once the kid arrives. So like if a child arrives on a Friday, if they haven't seen a picture of their child by Sunday, they're hysterical. Are they there? 
they'll say to me, are they there? <laughs> like, they're here. Well, I think it's really sad that kids um, don't have the opportunity to play freely now. Camp cameras and GPS tracking systems aren't the only new initiatives aimed at keeping tabs on kids. Daycare centers and nursery schools are installing webcams so parents can view real-time footage of their toddlers from anywhere. In Toronto, some primary schools have made it policy that under 12s cannot walk to or from school on their own. I think with all of this sound and fury that surrounds modern childhood now, something has been lost. And that is the simple, magical, soaring pleasure of being a child at play. Because that has been almost edited out of the modern experience. We see free play now and we regard it as either dangerous or we see it as a waste of time because it can't be measured. This is not nostalgia. This is not a desire for some glorious childhood past. People don't understand the value of play and that is a very serious problem that will have very serious consequences. This is the anxious age of hyper-parenting, where many kids are on a fast track trying to get a head start on the competition. Right, In some neighborhoods, the daily schedule for the under-12 set leaves literally no room for free play. I don't remember doing any of this at, at this age. All I remember on doing on a weekend, let's say, is waking up and having a whole day of freedom. And not that that's a bad thing. <laughs> But nowadays, things start really young, and I think it's better because I see how society has changed. It's all about competitiveness. I don't think there's a parent out there that can't admit that they would love to see their kid play a college sport. And if you see that your child is gifted at something, then it's okay to pursue that. Hyperparenting is really good parenting run amok in the sense that it starts from the very noble and natural instinct, which is to do the best for our children. But over the last generation, that impulse has morphed into something extreme. As parents now, we feel under pressure to push, polish, and protect our kids with superhuman zeal, to give them the best of everything and make them at the same time the best at everything. Okay. Go in the bathroom, I'll knock on the door. There's nothing wrong with extracurricular activities. In fact, they can be wonderful. On to the next destination. The trouble is that many kids are just getting too much of it. Monday, I have a hockey clinic, then Tuesday, I have hockey practice. Wednesday, I have soccer practice. Thursday, I have hockey practice again. Then Friday, I have soccer practice. Then Saturday, hockey game, baseball game, or soccer game. And then Sunday, same thing. The hardest part for me would probably be um, doing the homework in the car because I do get a little bit nauseous, but I just close my eyes for a couple minutes and keep working. So much play for children now is watched over, supervised, structured, spoon-fed by adults. The kids aren't given that, that time and space just to play on their own. Sport parenting. On. Where is the red hoodie? hoodie? Wait, I have a red hoodie. Joel, where's the red hoodie that I pulled out? She needs red, Joel, for the parade. Stop micromanaging. You know, my daughters, we're raring to go at 3.34 in the morning, ready to go to a, a game and travel. I mean, we're coming home at 9 o'clock to do a change. Some people are just waking up. We're in our third activity. We've been in two states already. Joel, I have the red hoodie because she needs it for the parade. Okay, but we're not going to the parade now. We're going to baseball. You know, my philosophy is work hard and play harder. Good night, Corey. They did a study that a lot of kids, especially women, that 
played sports, team sports, through college or through high school, have become very successful people. They interviewed some of the top CEO women in the country of the United States, and most of these p women had played some type of uh, sport in college or high school, organized sport. Beautiful. Leaving, let's go. The toughest um, part is like, um, sometimes you don't have no break between. Sometimes it's really hard to do that, having no break between sports. All right, you ready? It's on the other side. Tie to perfection. Ow. Sid, keep your head up. I love you. Have the best game ever. Always know you can always have to do yourself. Get it up! Come on! Shoot it! Shoot it, Gabby! Cut! No! Come on! To a lot of people nowadays, just letting your child go to the park with an old baseball bat, a ball, and a glove, and a couple of friends isn't good enough anymore. It just simply isn't good enough. He's got to be in a baseball clinic with a certified coach, and a brand new bat, and a brand new ball, and a brand new glove, and a uniform. Organized sports for kids are nothing new. It's how much of their lives they take up that's changed. Free play, for most children, has disappeared. But what does that matter to the kids themselves? Are they really missing anything by not playing the old-fashioned way? We've got a job to do today, guys. We win this, we move on to the quarterfinals, right? In here. One, two, three. Team! Squad up! That's it, it's attack! Defense! Back up, back up! Turn! Back here! It's that idea that sport builds character, positive character. Many people buy into that. The truth is, sport has the potential to build character. Open it, you guys, come on in. Elaine Rackman has made a career charting the conduct of coaches, spectators, and players in organized sports for kids. Generally, I think what happens is you see kids that um, are not engaged. They don't have to think for themselves. I've gone in and done workshops with groups of, of kids that unless you give them step-by-step -step instructions on how to do something, they just sit around because they haven't been told what to do. It's like they, ha they have no initiative. They don't have that creative impulse. They have no problem-solving skills. They don't even talk to each other. They just sit around and wait for someone else, an adult, to tell them what to do. Bill Fowler spent 33 years teaching play studies at McMaster University. You don't want to eliminate structure because it's a gauge for them as to what they are. But we have to get away from this role playing that it constantly goes on in structured sport even. Like you, you, you'll notice it with, with these kids, they have a role to play. And they're put in that role by a coach for an obvious reason, it's gonna help the competitive side of things, that if he is not touching the ball <laughs> very much, there's a reason for it. He's, he's being excluded because he doesn't do it all that well. Stats show us that 5% of all kids are considered to be athletically gifted. The problem is that our system right now is set up to serve that 5%. So that means 95% of the kids don't really do well. They're not engaged. They're not having fun. They don't necessarily get a positive self-esteem, positive self-image from being on these sports teams because they're not being played. They don't get to touch the ball. It isn't serving them a, a, a real positive purpose.
structured play may have its critics, but what is so special about its alternative? Ironically, what we once thought of as wasted time, free, unstructured play, turns out to be nothing less than nature's way of making sure kids learn. What do kids get out of free time? They learn cooperation, they learn communication, they learn how to be uh, creative problem solvers, they learn conflict resolution. Two people get to stop, I'll be up first interpersonal skills, social skills. That's emotional intelligence. That's how those skills are learned. Oh, yeah, we'll do five more times. If there are always parents there managing that and guiding that interaction, those kids never learn how to do that themselves. When the boys from the Wild Hawks team are asked to play a pickup game instead of their regular league game without the parents, coaches, or referees around, interesting things happen. What fascinated me the most is that the kids that really shone out here were not the kids that were picked as real leaders on, in the formal competitive environment. And that, to me, is really, really important. The kids that, that were real leaders out here, they were taking risks. They were having fun because they don't really get to do that in, in the other environment. Because if they make a mistake, I mean, you've got bleachers full of fans, spectators, adults, that are going to yell and scream at them. So why would you take a risk? The suburban kids are so used to this structure in their life. You know, we're here at this time. We have to do it this way. Locus of control has been lost. The kid never understands that he's in control of his life. It gives them that freedom to be essentially who they think they are. And, and we're not judging it. And that's huge. In a single generation, structured play has eclipsed the centuries-old tradition of free play among kids. But now, a growing body of research on play and child development points to a consensus that structured play, on its own, is not enough. Kids learn a lot during play, but as soon as an activity has a definitive goal and structure and, let alone, monitoring and supervision, it's not play. Don Fulgosi is an evolutionary psychologist in Toronto. He argues that play fulfills a vital role in our development as a species. Evolutionarily speaking, play is at least tens of millions of years old, maybe a billion years. When we find a behavior that is ubiquitous, that is universal, that appears spontaneously in all the children, in all the cultures, all the human groups, and when there is an energy expenditure associated with it, there are certain dangers and risks associated with it. That type of behavior then must have some adaptational value. Kids learn about the world of objects. And then there is social play, where kids learn about other kids, how they behave, how they should behave, how they should treat other kids. Make-believe play may be crucial to how we develop the whole concept of other people's minds, their intentions, and their beliefs. But what happens when kids play freely is hard to measure and therefore easy to dismiss, although studies have linked it to everything from literacy and creativity to social conduct and mental health, much of that research, critics argue, is not definitive because it's been based simply on watching kids play. But recently, new hard science has emerged that provides a clear link between play and our survival. Survival is really all about adaptability. And that's what play is. Play makes you nimble and adaptable. And that really is the biggest survival skill of all.
For decades, the research on play and its ultimate value to kids has been confined to observational science. But in 2008, laboratory science finally broke new ground, at last linking free play to the development of the brain. If you take rats that have been reared so that they're not experiencing any peer play, and then you test them as uh, adults, what you get is that the animals are socially incompetent. The next step was what we knew from early experiments that we had done, is that if you damage certain parts of the brain, you, you end up producing rats which show similar types of social incompetence to rats that haven't had any play experience. So if you're socially incompetent, if you haven't played, and you're socially incompetent because you got damaged this part of the brain, is it possible that play experience is in fact modifying the way that area of the brain's working, which then in turn influences your social competence? Pellis and his colleagues set up an experiment to see if that social incompetence, stress, anxiety, and emotional imbalance was somehow linked to play. He created two groups, one made up exclusively of young animals with lots of time for play, and another where adults were present with therefore less chance to play freely. One of the beautiful things about play is that it's a spontaneous behavior. If you're a young animal, you like doing it. You don't have to be rewarded to do it. You don't have to be taught to do it. You just put a number of young rats together and you can be assured that they're going to be playing up a storm of their own accord. When you open up a skull of any mammal, including a human, the majority of what you see is the cortex. And this is the most evolved, advanced part of the mammalian brain. The most frontal part of that frontal cortex, called the prefrontal cortex, is particularly related to social behavior. So people that have got damage in this area show poor social judgment, they show inappropriate social behavior, and so on. We felt that if any part of the brain is going to be affected by this differing social experience early, early on, it's got to be there. And so that's what led us to look at this particular part of the brain. These are the, the cells from the two groups of animals that we were looking at. Mm -hmm. And this is from the play-deprived group, so the juvenile just raised with the adult. And this is from the four juveniles together. If we compare these two cells, it's this and this that really stand out as different. This is way more complex. There's more branches, more overlap. What shows up in the Pellis experiment very clearly is that play leads directly to the maturation of the brain. The animals that are getting the chance to play when they're younger have to process more information, and so they need more connections across those areas. Right. It's getting information from more sources. If it's getting more information, it's got more, a better basis for making a decision as to what to do about a situation. And so this may account for why rats that have played as juveniles are just that much better at dealing with uncertainty in life. Because there's very little difference, biologically speaking, between a rat's brain and our own, what's true for rats is very likely true for humans too. In fact, the signs of play deprivation are already showing up. In record numbers, little kids with hectic lives and very little access to free play are winding up in therapy, complaining of stress, anxiety, and depression. Stress, we all know what stress is. Yeah. yeah. What, do you, what do you think stress is? Stress is when like, you're doing lots of work and you're tired of doing it. Who has too much stuff to do? Me. Tell me a story. Tell me a story about having too much to do. Last year, I only got to rest one day a week. Most days I have to do riding. It's, it's like every day. Even on the weekends, I don't get to rest. Only on one day, I get some relaxing. Um, it makes me feel some kind of stressed out. You feel stressed out? Yeah. We see a lot of kids that exhibit stress and anxiety in, in a lot of different ways. What scares you? I don't want you to tell me, and I don't want you to tell anybody else. They live a pretty complex life. They have a lot going on. They have to be scheduled to come to stress management. Everybody stand up. And we've heard it mentioned in our classes 
that they're looking for free play. Big deep breath. And breathe out. time, money, and energy that we're plowing into our children, we should be witnessing the emergence of the happiest, healthiest, most intelligent and creative and best adjusted kids the world has ever seen. But, but that's just not what's happening out there. And if you look around, you know, it's, it's, it's a laundry list of things going wrong. There are scientists who believe that by not allowing children to have their own free, unstructured play, that is actually one of the major causes behind the epidemic of attention deficit disorder. And it may be, as with all development, that there are windows of opportunity for different things to happen. So if by age six, children have not been allowed to play, it may be that some way the brain is wired can never be made up. There is enough evidence there to suggest that if kids are deprived of play, that they may develop later on diseases like anxiety and depression, or that they may become improperly socialized, become aggressive, become uh, psychopaths, violent criminals, and so on. There is a price to pay if we don't have this in our lives anymore. No one expects a return to the good old days when kids played outside on their own and came home when the lights went on. Yet the image of play as just a waste of time may finally be primed for a major rethink. One tub ball in or two? I've got one out up the top there and I've got the parachute out over there. So I don't know whether one UK company is breaking new ground, proving how simple changes to the way kids play can make a big difference to how they learn. An experiment is designed to see if changes made to the playground can impact the precise behavioral and learning problems the kids were struggling with in class. We just felt that the children were very reliant on us, um, the teachers, that we had to feed them with everything. They were, weren't very willing to take risks with many things um, or work together. You know, they would work together if they knew the teacher was watching them, but if the teacher you know, was busy with another group, um, they weren't as focused on their activities. The two key skills that they picked out were working together and problem solving. Could we demonstrate that there were links between what happened in the playground and in the classroom? They start by simply observing what kids do on an ordinary playground. What we did was looked at the range of play types available on that playground and through observation found a huge lack of cooperative and social play as well. It was really boring because, I don't know, there was just nothing to do. You just sat there. Everyone just gets really bored and then they start messing about. Because when you do get bored, the only thing you can really do is mess about, if you're, if you're like one of the boys in my class anyway. It weren't that fun. There weren't stuff to play with. I would play football. It weren't very exciting. We saw children skipping with the skipping ropes. Um, we saw the bat and the ball games happening. Um, they weren't being used in a, any sort of imaginative or creative way. Um, and there's a question there about, well, what if you don't like that sort of sports stuff? What if you don't want to do that sort of thing for 40 minutes at your lunchtime? Um, what if you want to tell a story? What if you want to invent a game? What if you want to use your imagination? What we wanted to do was give them the opportunity to play in a different way. So to do that, we had to make some changes. Over the space of six weeks, the play workers introduced small but creative changes to the playground at recess. We're trying to do things that are unexpected. 
There's a thing called neophilia, which means that children are excited by things that are new and novel. So what we're trying to do is make sure that every day the playground is um, new and exciting. What are they going to do with these, do you think? I have no idea. <laughs> It's been six weeks since a new play culture was introduced to the kids at St. William's School in Norwich. It's just really fun to see what we can do with different things, because these are new things. Loose parts have high play value. You know, if you give a child a cardboard box with a present in it, what do they get most play out of? The cardboard box. It sparks children's creativity, it sparks their imagination, it makes them think in lots of different directions. So in terms of links to the children's problem-solving skills, then loose parts are the way we've gone to see if we can have an impact on those skills. I was imaginative anyway, but I think it's helped even more to make, to make me be even more creative and, um, like, more... I socialised a lot more because you have to share things. And like everyone like wants some of the equipment because it's all really good equipment and there's not like loads of it. So you do learn to play and interact with different people. You learn to negotiate. Yeah, negotiate. You learn to negotiate more and like compromise. A couple of us made a friendship wall. We made up a friendship wall on the climbing wall and we put loads of stuff that represented us as in like what type of people we are. As the new equipment comes risk, there is more uh, chance of increased physical risk and also emotional risk. Many children in, in my group weren't very willing to take risks, would only tend to put their hands up if they knew for certain that they had the answer right. Um, they didn't feel comfortable, many of them, to just have a go, and if they were wrong, it didn't matter. Children have to be able to um, try out those things in play. So in the playground, for example, my boy, I've been used to playing football for the last goodness knows how many years, um, and all of a sudden, I'm walking around with a flower pot on my head and a walking stick. Now, can I take that risk? Is that OK to do that? Am I going to be made to look silly? Are my mates going to laugh at me and nobody's going to talk to me forever? Certainly on the playground, we're seeing children with a lot more flexibility, with a lot more inventiveness, a lot more creativeness, and a lot less permission-seeking. And that's making a difference in how they actually work together in the classroom. A minor playground makeover has paid major dividends in the classroom in less than two months. The project gets extended in the hopes of even more improvement over time. They've become more independent, being able to work together in a group much more, being able to resolve difficulties when they arise between themselves rather than have to come to the teacher to house for help. I think it's helped in the classroom. Everyone's, I wouldn't say smarter, but everyone's a lot more like, a, awake, listening and concentrating a lot more. It's a lot more better by miles. Building on what happened here, researchers are now linking the benefits of play, not just to the classroom, but to the economy as well. Letting kids play, letting them have that spirit of creativity will really be the secret of innovation and solving problems. And that's what the future of the economy rests on. What you really want are people who know how to take risks, and know how to solve problems and aren't afraid to face uncertainty. This is all about uncertainty. This kind of pioneer research has touched off a new movement in the UK and in other corners of the world where the central idea is managed risk. Are you guys allowed to play in the street? Yeah. I want to play 
in the tree, but my mum don't let me. My mum, she's one of those mums, she won't let, she won't even let, I have to hold her hand really tight when I cross the road, she won't even let me in the park go somewhere where I can't see her. She gets really scared that I've died or something, it's just ridiculous. It's about bringing some adventure and autonomy back into children's lives, not just for fun, but also to prepare them for an uncertain future. In London, they're called adventure playgrounds. Ironically, their chief proponent is a man who, until recently, made his living discouraging risk. How can we justify stopping children having minor accidents when, in fact, by having those minor accidents, they're probably learning better life skills? If we put in risky, challenging, say, climbing structures, they may fail to comply with standards. They may be a little bit adventurous. Then the children get the risk, they get the exposure to risk, and they get the sense of being able to assess the risk for themselves. If we don't give them that ability to challenge themselves and to test their ability to balance, they will simply find that risk and that challenge elsewhere. And the elsewhere, because it is in inevitably an unmanaged setting, the risk is, is far greater. I've been to loads of playgrounds in my life. I'd probably say that this is kind of like I've been 100, 100 points. This is the best park ever. <laughs> So you'll fall on the playground. What's the worst thing that can happen? You can even break a leg. Is that better than not being exposed to these situations at all? I don't think so. <laughs> Just think of the infant that's trying to walk. The whole experience is filled mostly with falls. You know, and if the kid never falls, the first time he does is going to be trouble. There are those mavericks out there willing to take a stand against the tyranny of the timetable and let kids play freely. A few communities in North America set aside one day a year with no homework or extracurricular activities. In England, the Tory party has launched a campaign for more outdoor play. But for the most part, letting kids off the leash and exposing them to risk of any kind, even in the name of growth, is still taboo. When I told the other mothers at school about what I'd let Izzy do, they didn't say it was horrible. They just said, ooh, they were too scared to do it, and they wouldn't do it with their precious son. Like you're not precious, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In New York City, a single act of parental rebellion attracted scorn from around the world. I couldn't believe the kind of response I get. Uh, it's, been, it's been hundreds of thousands of people coming to the website. I mean, let's look at this. Here's the original article. Why I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone. I let people weigh in for or against. Here's the first one. Dumbass, I, I think we can agree that one objects, OK? Thinks that I was crazy to let my son go. He'd been asking, Mom, well, you know, can I go someplace sometime and you'll just leave me and let me try to get home by myself? I talked it over with my husband. We thought, well, that sounds fine. And so that's what we did. We let him get home by himself on the subway um, after I left him someplace new, which was the handbag department of Bloomingdale's. I wrote the article in my newspaper, uh, the New York Sun, why I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone. And I came home, as I do, from my job every day. And then around 10 at night, uh, the phone rang, and it was a booker from the Today Show. And I thought, ooh, this is an issue, <laughs> you know? And then suddenly we were known worldwide as the crazy mom and the extremely lucky, fortunate, can't believe he happened to survive, nine-year-old boy. <laughs> the boy who lived. The world is a risky place. There are dangers everywhere. And really what parenting is about is, is about equipping children to cope with those risks. The goal of child rearing is to produce an independent, autonomous human being. You don't suddenly take the leash off when someone is 21. You have to let the leash out gradually. You know, in architecture, less is more. 
Well, I think that's true in parenting too. A little benign neglect is good. As a human being, my concern is that the kids may be missing on something that is the greatest fun in their lives at the time. And if they're missing on fun, they're missing on childhood. I'd like everybody to remember childhood as something that was a charmed period of life. I mean, society defines itself not always and entirely by how it works, but by also by how it plays. And I think that if we deny children the right to play, if we deny them the space to learn the gift of play and to indulge it, then all of us will be poorer in the long run. I thought, like, finally I'm free for once. <laughs>